ask you a series of questions. Did the atheistic bride wear a pretty white dress? Was she thinking of you? Is that what you medically need to know? What jewelry did your bride wear? She never wears any jewelry. No underwear either. Remember, the honeymoon was in Paris. Because we didn't leave the room for two weeks. House was trying to aggravate the patient, but it seems like his plan backfired spectacularly. Interestingly though, Mark is talking about a honeymoon here, and that's the name of this episode, so that has to be a clue. Very excited to be reacting to House MD Season 1, Episode 22, Honeymoon. On this channel, we are reacting to all 177 House episodes. This would be episode 49. Let's see if I can get the diagnosis before House does as a doctor working in London. You'll be here because I didn't tell him you'd be here. Greg House. And the other doctors checked me out. I said it was just stress. House is in heaven right now. Not only does he get to make his ex-wife's new husband jealous, but he also is so good that he's the only medical treatment option for her. He's definitely made it. Now Stacy, his ex-wife, who also happens to be a lawyer, was saying that her husband's getting abdominal pain, mood swings, and aggression. Sounds like he ate too much Taco Bell. Other spicy conditions could be a neuroendocrine tumor or Pick's disease, which is a type of accelerated dementia of the frontal and temporal lobes that controlled personality. Definitely need more clues. Someone call 911 for a wagon to Princeton Plainsboro. Yes, sir. You dosed him. I was a little worried they were gonna get here before he passed out. Would have been tougher to get him to drink. Tougher to get him to drink. Oh, there's an ambulance here. Who's it for? You, but I'm fine. You won't be after that. Oh, well, I am a red pill kind of guy. Ooh. One interesting point here is that usually after putting a drug in someone's drink, there will be a delay in the effect. The most common one used would be rohypnol, which takes 15 to 20 minutes to actually kick in. As much as I enjoy watching House and Mark lock horns, I can't imagine we'd stick around long if we'd spent half the episode waiting for Mark to pass out. MRAs were clean. You're cutting him open? Called Goldstein. The surgery's on. Goldstein found nothing but a distended bladder. Give me the video of the surgery. That's abdominal epilepsy. What? Abdominal epilepsy is exceptionally rare, with just under 40 cases reported in the last 40 years. One was in a journal named Curious. I don't own it, I promise. And it mentioned a 20-year-old male who had severe piercing abdominal pain for months. All the investigations were normal and so the doctors referred him to psychiatry for psychogenic abdominal pain. The psychiatrist then thankfully bounced him back to neurology who decided to investigate further and found he had an abnormal EEG showing sharp wave discharges in the temporal leads. He was then started on anti-epileptic meds and within eight months, his symptoms had vanished. I bet he's glad he got a second opinion, although in my experience, it's rare that a second opinion will be of benefit, but every case is different. He's in some sort of neurological problem. Time bomb in his brain. So a very small, diffuse abnormality in the brain waves, probably white matter, it means his axonal nerves are dying. All this patient's scans have been normal. His main symptom has been abdominal pain and there have been no motor symptoms at all. He also has had a bowel symptoms, which could be due to epilepsy and also damage to the fight or flight or rest and digest nervous systems. We call them collectively the autonomic nervous systems. These things are helpful to know as what nerves are affected give us a clue as to what conditions could have affected those fibers. Helpfully, in 1944, Erlanger and Gasser were awarded the Nobel Prize in Physiology for Medicine for mapping out all the different functions of nerve fibers. They run from A to C, descending from large, fast, highly myelinated nerves to small, unmyelinated nerves. The more myelin the nerves have, generally the faster signal as it protects the inside of the nerve like a plastic wrapper around your phone's charger cable. So there are a alpha neurons that do position sense and motor, a beta neurons that do vibration, position sense from muscle spindles and light touch, a gamma which does motor to muscle spindles controlling reflexes, a delta controlling sensory to fast pain and cold temperature, then B fibers that, that are autonomic nerve fibers in the preganglionic area, so upper parts 
of the spinal cord and C fibers which are in the dorsal route that control pain, touch, temperature, conduct impulses from the cutaneous receptors as well. And then you've got sympathetic C fibers that control fight or flight responses further down. So it seems like our patient could have a delta and C fibers being affected, which we call small fiber neuropathy. The causes of that are very interesting. You've got autoimmune conditions like Sjogren's syndrome and sarcoidosis, diabetes, hereditary amyloid neuropathy, and paraproteinemia as well. I want to do protein electrophoresis of his blood, autoimmune screening blood tests, check his sugars, do a HIV test, do a lumbar puncture for cerebral infections and abnormal protein. And this episode is extremely diagnostically interesting. I like it. Enough nerves die, he dies. Global axonal nerve death. Sent CSF for CBC and viral serologies to rule out encephalitis and get tau proteins to check for Alzheimer's. Global axonal nerve death. Sounds like a Bruce Lee finishing move. Seems like House is suspecting early onset Alzheimer's and encephalitis. Foreman mentioned earlier though that he thought the problem was with the white matter. That being said, there's no way he could have known that just from the EEG. As he mentioned, the abnormality was small and diffuse quite non-specific. So if Mr. Neurologist were correct, then that rules out Alzheimer's, which is a gray matter disease. Encephalitis, as we call it in the UK, can cause white matter lesions in adults, but, but usually if they do, the patient has severe symptoms like altered conscious level, which our patient who had to be spiked because he thinks nothing is wrong, clearly doesn't have. Although he said earlier that he won because he married House's ex-wife, but I wouldn't feel too secure about that right now since House is switching on the charm with Stacey. So question for you smart people, what percentage of over 65s have dementia? Answers down below. What was he like before his leg? Pretty much the same. He's clear. No Alzheimer's. Dear houseboys, a snack for your highly illegal search. Love Stacey, secret stash. Amphetamines. And that is why they do their illegal searches. So brilliant. Can you imagine if every time you went to a hospital, someone broke into your house? Then when they don't break into your house, you'd wonder why? Am I not interesting enough? Do you not care? So toxic, I love it. Interestingly, Cameron said they ruled out dementia by the lack of something called the tau protein on the lab test. Since we doctors are mega nerds, a guy named Clark decided he would test how good this marker is by comparing these tau levels before death with autopsy proven dementia patients after death and published the results in 2003. Now, if the tau protein test was high, the patient had an 84% chance to have autopsy proven dementia. That means the test had a positive predictive value of 84%, which is pretty good. But if the test is negative, that only two out of three of those patients didn't have dementia, so about as useful as armbands on a motorbike. With these amphetamines, the challenge will be, did they cause the condition or is he self-medicating to try and limit the impact of his condition? The good old chicken or egg situation, except the chicken is on speed. Maybe these were confiscated by a high school guidance counselor. Which means we're back to Alzheimer's. Abbott, the marker tests were negative. He could still have it. PET scan will reveal any change in metabolic activity in the cerebral cortex. Oh, I would take my chances in the US, thanks. Do you know how much an inpatient PET CT costs? $7,275. $7,275. Yes, the PET CT machine itself might sound expensive at $2 million, but that means they need to do just 300 scans to make their money back. Some hospitals don't even buy the scanners either, they just rent them. So no wonder people like Vogler are interested in running a hospital. So why is a PET CT scanner so expensive and what does it actually do? Well, it can determine levels and locations of particular molecules, helping to understand how they're metabolized. Like in cancer, if you inject glucose, you'll see a high density of cells that are taking up glucose around where the cancer is as they have higher metabolic requirements. Or if you want to see how a particular drug is metabolized in the body, you can literally see it by adding a radio label to the drug 
and detect it in almost real time. Now to use this scan to check for Alzheimer's, we would want to detect any pathological aggregates of that tau protein that we mentioned earlier. So a radio tracer that binds to tau would be injected and then that is tracked using the PET scan to see if there are aggregates or not. It better predicts future cognitive decline than the current usual imaging, which is MRI. It may tell us as well if it is a dementia that's not Alzheimer's like Pick's disease or frontotemporal dementia that would still fit pretty well here, to be fair. And then I'm gonna ask you a series of questions. Did the atheistic bride wear a pretty white dress? Was she thinking of you? Is that what you medically need to know? What jewelry did your bride wear? She never wears any jewelry. No underwear either. Remember the honeymoon was in Paris. Because we didn't leave the room for two weeks. House was trying to aggravate the patient, but it seems like his plan backfired spectacularly. Interestingly though, Mark is talking about a honeymoon here, and that's the name of this episode, so that has to be a clue. Maybe an area of the brain is lighting up more than it should. They're talking about the limbic system and he seems to be riled up, getting overly sexual and aggressive, although most of house is overly sexual. But the same area of the brain that controls anger also controls sexual desire and it's called the amygdala. What if we're witnessing a temporal lobe partial seizure right now affecting the amygdala triggered by a heightened emotional state. That would match my theory of frontal temporal symptoms quite well. And in early stages, these patients can present with seizure. Other options could be brain tumors, still encephalitis, potentially. The season finale hasn't disappointed so far. I don't know what's wrong with him. I haven't given up. My toes, they were numb. Time marches on. He's paralyzed. We have a new symptom, whole body paralysis with sensory loss. Now that is spicy. There are only a handful of things that can cause sensory motor neuropathy like this. In the box, things could be Guillain-Barre, polio, or B12 deficiency, leading to subacute combined degeneration of the cord. Motor neuron disease would be way slower onset, and also, believe it or not, only affects motor neurons. Thank you, scientists, for naming at least something sensibly. Out of the box things could be non-epileptic seizures, also could be migraine, but that doesn't quite fit the story. My previous amygdala theory seems to have held as much water as a sieve. So what else could be honeymoon related? Uh, what if it's testicular paraneoplastic syndrome? What if the reason why Mark's talking so much about him and Stacey's sex life to house is because he's insecure about it. It no longer exists. So she wouldn't find a lump, house would never think to go looking there, and the patient probably hasn't been checking it either because it reminds him of how little action he's getting. Oh, that would fit the storyline so well. Paraneoplastic limbic encephalitis. Now, if you think testicular cancer paraneoplastic syndrome is a spicy diagnosis, then check out the channel membership. You get priority reply to comments, early access to new videos, and being able to suggest a series and episode for me to react to. For a limited time, only the first 30 members have a chance to win a one hour, one on one medical tutor session with me on a topic of your choice. We currently have 21 members with only nine spots left. So make sure to join now to secure your space. The earlier you join, the earlier I can react to your suggestions. So press join now. Beyond Barre syndrome attacks, they're not the brain. Treatment isn't all that dangerous. Plasmapheresis and IVIG. If he dies, it was something else. House saying that so casually here is definitely not an accident. His ex-wife, who he obviously still has the hots for, is potentially going to become a vulnerable widow. Guess who will be there to pick up the pieces? The funny thing is though that House loves the puzzle too much to put his self-interest first. Even if he didn't have an iota of empathy for Mark, he'd still want the satisfaction of knowing he beat whatever kind of mega puzzle this is in the hope that his ex will bask in his awe and leave her newly cured spouse to ride into the sunset with House on horseback. 
or he goes home and has a pot noodle. Now, Guillain-Barre is a very rare condition and is quite interesting. It causes ascending paralysis starting from the feet or hands and slowly works its way up. The critical point is if it gets to the muscles that control the breathing, then it's likely game over. It usually has a trigger like an aggressive stomach bug like Campylobacter or a respiratory illness like the flu virus. Essentially, your body mounts an immune response against the invading pathogen and then antibodies cross-react with your own nerve fibers causing quite literally self-destruction. House said here that you can have Guillain-Barre with no antibodies present, which is possible as only 60% have the typical anti-glycolipid antibodies. In other cases though, there may be antibodies that we don't know about yet that are triggering it, and House wants to filter this patient's plasma using plasmapheresis and bind the antibodies using IVIG to try and limit the symptoms though. It won't work, House, until you channel your inner chase and Go down under. His throat's closing up. I can't breathe. A reaction to the IVIG. I need an stat. It's not that. He's having allergic reaction. He's crashing. No, he's not. Look at his vitals. I'm betting the only abnormal sign is sweaty palms. Just a panic attack. The symptoms of anaphylaxis can overlap with panic attacks and make it look seriously convincing, like you saw here. Both have chest tightness, palpitation, shortness of breath, a sense of impending doom. Some clues to be able to differentiate them is that in anaphylaxis, you may have hives on the skin or swelling seen on the lips and tongue, known as angioedema. The blood pressure in a panic attack will likely be high, and in anaphylaxis, it will be low. That's because the release of all the pro-inflammatory cytokines cause dilatation of the blood vessels and subsequently drop the pressure. Any kid who's ever used a spitball from a straw knows that the smaller the straw, the more likely you'll hit your friend Jimmy in the eye. Blood pressure is a similar concept. It isn't science fun. So question for you smart people. What percentage of people get panic attacks? Answer down below. He's not responding to treatment and some part of me wants him to die. You two are good together. I took you to Paris. We never went to Paris. When did Mark switch from mountain biking to yoga? About a month ago. Same time we started getting sick. Oh, very interesting. So Mark is creating memories to fill the gaps in his mind, which we call confabulation. There's no intention to deceive other people and it's part of a neuropsychiatric disorder. Definitely could still be part of my primary suspicion of testicular cancer with limbic encephalitis as a paraneoplastic syndrome. The classic cause of confabulations though is something called Korsakoff syndrome where a deficiency in vitamin B1 or thiamine causes a type of psychosis. So it typically is caused by excessive alcohol use, but that doesn't seem to be the case here as the team would have picked up on that on his tox screen and liver function as well, most likely. The mountain biking to yoga fits too. Sitting on even the most ergonomic mountain bike as a guy isn't exactly a scrotal bubble bath at the best of times. Never mind if you've got a grapefruit third wheel tagging along for the ride. If I'm wrong, I swear, I'm gonna start a GoFundMe to sue Universal Studios. Delusions. Now here's the thing about acute intermittent porphyria. They'll jump you in a dark alley, beat the crap out of you, leave you bleeding. But it wears gloves, so no fingerprints. Ah, perforia! Where is that GoFundMe link? Okay, to be fair, very good diagnosis. It's a rare genetic condition, causes accumulation of heme precursors in the liver, and presents with abdominal pain, nausea, vomiting, peripheral neuropathy, and seizures. Now the classic symptom that's missing here that probably would have made it a bit too easy is that these patients have red to brown urine. It changes color as it comes in contact with air and becomes oxidized, kind of like an old steak. So treatment of acute attacks is with intravenous heme. Damn, I think House has got me on this one. Start the treatment. Hematin and glucose. Only one way to confirm AIP. Urine sample made during the attack. Habituates, alcohol, high levels of protein will set off an attack. That's why I'm gonna give in the combo plate. All of it. Welcome to House's House of Cocktails. What would you like today? Ah, oh, the Reaper Dance. Excellent choice. A little bit of orange juice, squeeze of lime. Ah, oh, and the secret ingredient, phenobarbital. 
it packs a bigger punch than me sleeping with your wife. So House wants to trigger an attack so he can diagnose porphyria, which to be fair is quite accurate since it's quite difficult to diagnose porphyria when the attack has subsided, except with a genetic test which can take about three weeks. It'd be rare for porphyria to be this progressive though, and people with the condition have a normal life expectancy. So how do the drugs House wants to give the patient trigger this condition? Well, essentially, there is a heme metabolic pathway of which an enzyme known as 5 amino levelinate synthase, or ALAS1, is the rate limiting step or gatekeeper of the pathway. Now, further down in the pathway in acute intermittent perforia, there is reduced activity of an enzyme called perfobilinogen deaminase. That means that when ALAS1 is induced, metabolites such as perforbilinogen and aminolevulinic acid build up in the blood, these can lead to the neurovisceral symptoms that we saw the patient here having. So drugs that increase levels of this ALAS1 enzyme cause the buildup of these metabolites. There are loads of things that can induce it as well, like alcohol or starvation states can increase its activity. And that's why House wanted to give the patient glucose during the attack. To reduce the activity of ALAS1, heme helps to inhibit this pathway by building up the free heme pool, which acts as a negative feedback loop, telling the enzyme to stop as well. Very interesting. He doesn't want the trigger. Give him the cocktail, set off an attack. No, I gave him the parameters, it's his call. You want him to die. Give me the syringe. He can't do it. <clears throat> Oh, impressive the way House fooled his team into thinking he wasn't going to give it. Then as soon as they believed him, he strikes. If one of these patients he assaults ever gets House struck off, at least he knows he has an alternative career in acting. One interesting thing to mention though is that Mark here was not having an attack and that's why House wanted to induce one and yet he's still paralyzed. How is that the case if there aren't enough toxic metabolites to detect in the urine? Makes for good television though. Now many of the drugs that trigger perforia are what we call lipophilic. That means they can cross the lipoid cell membranes faster to be absorbed and exert their action. I'd expect the cocktail to start working within about five minutes. You may be wondering how Stacy convinced House to give the cocktail. Well, House still hadn't forgiven her for the decision she made about his leg in the previous episode. She brought his attention to the fact that she was just doing to him what he does to patients all the time, stopping him from making a dumb decision. I have to say this episode is very good. 8.5 out of 10 entertainment, 8 out of 10 accuracy, 8.5 out of 10 diagnosis. Very strong. What's happening? Ah! Half is out, there's no way to collect Heart the sample. In the floor. Ah! Straight from the bladder. He's still a maniac. You fixed him. I'm not over you. Okay. I didn't get the diagnosis right, but bring in the horse, because did I predict them riding off into the sunset together? Also, porphyria isn't curable, but it is manageable. You can avoid triggers and know how to manage attacks, but what happens if you know you have porphyria and the only medication that will treat a condition you have is known to trigger an attack? Do you take the medication? Do you hold off and try and do without it? As always, it's a risk versus benefit decision based on how unwell the patient is, but generally, if you're considering giving it, they're unwell enough to warrant it. We would lean towards the side of treat first and manage the consequences later on this one, which is a pretty house-esque way of managing it in the real world. Anyways, enough science for now. I want to see this sunset ride. More than one, you always will be. I can't be with you. With you, I was lonely. With Mark, there's room for me. <sighs> Stacy is such a tease, and now she's been offered a job as a hospital lawyer, so House now has to see what he's missing out on on a daily basis. And then Mark just passionately embraced Stacy. House ended up on drugs again, so this has the makings of a very promising storyline. 
This episode is very good and it only makes sense when you understand how Stacy dealt with House's leg situation right here in House MD Three Stories. It's the highest rated episode in the whole series, so watch it now. I'm Sarah Med, stay curious.